I don't know, I have to do a lot of meditation and stuff to like help deal with that. I think this business generates a lot of anxiety. Oh, it absolutely does. Yeah. Yeah. Because things change and they don't tell you why. And Oh, there's control issues. There's yeah. egos you're dealing with. There's high stakes. There's, sure. I mean, like you said, this matters. This is important. I want to do a great job. I want to impress someone. And that anxiety, yeah, it can really, it, it can it can shut you down. It can yeah. make you react badly. It can make, it can true. cause your worst self to come out. Yeah, it, it can, and the focus is in the wrong direction. You're focusing inward as opposed to out. You know, when you're in the arts, you should be looking out, not in. Where does your positive outlook come from? That's an interesting question because I wonder if I I struggle. Okay, I'll say it this way: I struggle with the positive outlook. I know that um, when I'm speaking when I'm teaching, I strive very much to put that out there because I want that energy. Um, but it is something I have to work on. It is, it, I, I am naturally a cynical person um, and I have to watch that. Uh, there's a book called The Happiness Advantage. If you've ever read it, it's an excellent book about the study of joy uh, and how powerful it is in someone's life. Um, for example, if you say your car breaks down, your engine block overheats or something. And if you walk out there to try to fix your car and you're angry and ah, oh, darn my stupid car, I gotta fix this. Your mind shuts down. Instead of if, as opposed to if you go to the car problem and you go, all right, how are we gonna fix this problem now? Your mind, that studies show that your mind is 30% more active when you approach a, prob a problem with joy as opposed to cynicism. So same, same with being on film set or whatever, if you're angry and cynical and frustrated, you are less creative. That is so vital to understand. Now I know this and knowing that I struggle with cynicism, I have to every day reframe it. Um, that's where it comes from. It's, it, it's, uh, that's where it starts. But also comes from like, I love this job. I love this industry. I, we, we are working, all of us, in one of the coolest industries there is. And it's, it's like moths to the flame, right? If any, you know, I'm sure you've done it where you've done an interview somewhere or shooting, it doesn't matter how big or small it is, people will stop and ask, what are you, what are you guys shooting? It's because everybody's drawn to it. Uh, it there's a magic to it and I, I can't get enough of it. I mean, I've sacrificed everything to get here. So like, why be mad? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people who are in this industry. I, I never understood that. Um, cause I mean, like me personally, I, I don't have kids because of this industry. Like I never felt like my career was to, you know, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. So, you know, here I am many years later and I don't have children. A lot of people leave their families and homes to get to LA, for example. Uh, so why be frustrated and angry about that? It just, this is a joy. We get to meet people. Most people don't get to meet. We get to see and go into buildings or countries or whatever that most people don't get to do and it's we get to move people and educate people and we can change minds and perspectives and i don't know if i find myself getting cynical and angry i have to remind myself of that how much how lucky i am to get to do this you know it's uh it's it's amazing i think too there's an there's like this accepted um I'm at a loss for words, but with, with being in LA, maybe maybe other big cities, there's an accepted cynicism. If you're too happy-go-lucky and joyous, mm -hmm. which people, it might be someone's natural state, it may, may not, but people will be like, oh, what are they trying to sell me? So I yeah, think here, that, there's an accepted cynicism. That could be. It's, uh, it's so weird. I, yeah, and the, you know, I will say for LA, so I, I grew up, in other cities. I'm from Portland, Oregon initially, and I've lived all over the country, and then I've only lived in LA for a few years now. There is a slightly different energy, but I will say it's only in pockets in LA, it's certain sides of the city. Um, and I think you can choose to draw that energy, energy towards you, you know, the more positive side. I don't think you want to be around the cynicism side. I try not to, to be around people who emanate that energy because it will affect you, like it, it, it'll affect your work. It'll change what you're doing as a storyteller. Um, and it's, I think, a, this doesn't necessarily refer to your question, but all of us are sold on what this industry is. You know, we all fell in love with film at some point, right? 
and we're sold on the dream that you will be plucked out of obscurity, like the claw toy, at the, you know, the little toy thing that picks the claw up. You want toys are the claw. We're all sold on this idea, like Spielberg. You know, he meets the, whoever it was, the president of whatever it was, Universal or something, grooms him to be in TV, and then by 23, he directs Jaws. You know, that's what we're sold on. Robert Rodriguez does his first movie for $6,000, and boom, the head of, what was it, CAA or something, like finds him and sweeps him into stardom. We're sold on that idea. Um, the reality is that's not normal. That's obscure. Most people don't do that. So they end up working their way up, working in some sort of job that didn't look the way they thought it would look. Uh, I had a friend who was working on a television show as a uh, camera operator for the most part and then a cinematographer once in a while. And it was a terrible TV show. Like, and he complained about it endlessly. Like, oh man, no, I just, and he tells me one day, yeah, I'm working on the show, but I'm embarrassed to tell anyone I'm working on it because the show is so bad. Simultaneously, I'm telling him I would give anything to direct one of those episodes. I don't care if it's bad, but here we are. Both, both of us are looking at the show, the terrible show, with, from two different directions, right? I would give anything just for the chance to direct on it. He's embarrassed to tell anyone he's working on it. Both of us are unhappy. And I'm like, dude, you're working on a TV show. Like, how cool is that? And you're, you're upset about it. It's because it doesn't look like what we, the picture that we were sold when we were younger. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it just, it, you know, opportunity just arrived differently and we're just, well, I'm not working. My budget's not big enough or I'm not working with XYZ actor or whatever it is that your mental picture of success looks like or industry work looks like. It's, uh, we have to throw that away. Um, I had a really a big epiphany that happened to me years ago. I, you know, I was sold on that same dream. You know, I fell in love with movies when I was, I don't know, very, very young. I grew up in the golden age of Spielberg. You know, I remember when Raiders came out and I remember when like uh, Close Encounters had a huge impact on me. I went home and uh, imagined the film in my head because I didn't have access to a camera. So I just had to close, I literally went in my room, closed my eyes and thought, the film through from beginning to end just to try to capture all those images I saw. Fell in love with it from that point forward. And I was sold on the dream where you'll go there and you'll get plucked. Well, so I sacrificed everything to get into the industry um, and I can't, I, I, no one will hire me, right? I get out of college and I can't find a job. I can't do anything. And I ended up moving to Nashville and working on low end music videos. And then I got into corporate work and I was so frustrated all the time. So like, cause I was doing these industrial films and these educational videos and I wasn't making movies. And I was, I found, I realized that I was angry all the time cause I wasn't where I thought I should be, whatever that means. And I realized one day that, so what am I gonna do? Am I just gonna be angry until I get to where I think I should be? Like, is, is it, what, is there gonna be an angry switch? I'm gonna turn it off? Cause I'm putting out a lot of toxic waste, you know, and my energy is gonna keep me from getting hired. You know, people meet me and I'm just emanating this negative vibe. Like, are they really gonna wanna pull me up to another level to work on something else? Simultaneously with that, I watched Jurassic Park. Okay, <laughs> great film, right? Well, in the middle of Jurassic Park, there's, the, you remember the segment where it's, um, the characters have to learn about, we, or the audience has to learn about how are dinosaurs made, right? Remember this little scene? And the characters in the movie watch this little video about dino DNA. Remember this? Where they're on the little ride and there's, every no, 65 million years ago, a mosquito <laughs> jumps on a dinosaur and then lands on a tree branch and gets caught in the sand. You know, you remember that? Like, and then they extract they, that little whole video about how they got the blood from a dinosaur back then. And then, you know, this is dino DNA. That whole little, little Mr. DNA or whatever the DNA cartoon strand was, right? Well, you know what that is? That's Steven Spielberg making a corporate video, right? It's an instructional video. It's, it's a very memorable part of the film. It's one, when I bring it up, most people remember it because it had a big impact. It's very important 
for Jurassic Park, because otherwise the audience won't understand what's going on, how we've got dinosaurs. Um, do you think Spielberg, you know, cussed and kicked his feet and moaned about the fact that he had to make an informational video in the middle of Jurassic? No, he didn't. He was like, how can we make this fun, right? So I'm looking at that and those kinds of videos are what I'm working on. Well, what if I just pretended that I was making a bigger film and this is just one little piece? And that decision, that day I switched, turned that switch, it changed everything. It suddenly my job became fun because I started thinking, well, okay, it's just an interview with the CEO, but what if this is part of my bigger, you know, whatever, what it may, whatever fantasy movie I want to come up with, it's an action adventure, but we have this little thing. How would I shoot this if this were a movie? My work improved. The clients noticed. The jobs started getting better. They started giving me bigger budgets. And eventually some of those turned into narrative things. And now today I have actually carved out a niche in the corporate world doing narrative storytelling for corporations, short films. I just finished one that's a choose your own adventure film for a hospital network. It was the most fun job I've had in a long time. It's not a feature film. You'll never see it in a theater, but it was great. And you're helping people like, and the best part, I'm getting paid to make shorts. I'm working with actors. I'm writing scripts. I'm getting paid to do it, you know, as I work my way up in the industry. And I've also gotten feature films based on that work. So, that whole mindset helped me a ton. It was, it was, it was life changing. It seems like you like a sense of play with yeah. everything that you do. And yeah. do you think that that brings like this spark to it and that kind of squashes some of the cynicism? Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And I think it's important. Um, you know, that comes with not taking yourself too seriously as well. And again, like I said before, it's, what's the point of taking yourself so seriously? We're, what we're doing is fun. Literally just today, I had a phone call, a conference call with a client about the most standard corporate video you can imagine. You know, it's an interview with the CEO with B-roll of the company. Now, the temptation is to just go, oh. But instead, to try to make it fun, because it's fun, I'd rather do that than flip burgers or bartend. That's, that is my option. You know, so let's, let's have some fun with it. And guess what? You know what the client said on the phone? They're like, man, no one's ever come into our company with this kind of energy before. Like you make it fun and you make, because we love our company and you're actually like embracing what we're doing. It's great. Like, this is great. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's vital for survival. It'll help you get work. It'll help you keep going. It's helped me for sure. Where does your work ethic come from? Because I also see, it seems like you have a very strong work ethic. Yeah, I, probably my parents, you know, my, my, both my fathers and my mother, like they've, they're, um, taught me the value of hard work as a child, you know, <laughs> being lazy was a big thing in my household. You know, <laughs> I was called lazy a lot when I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. And, and especially the integrity of, um, when no one's looking doing the work anyway. You know, my dad was like that, you know, when he would, he wouldn't just go to work and then go home and drink a beer. He'd go home and he'd read a book about what he's doing. He would find ways to improve his craft in some way. That's, and if you want to make it, not just work in, the indus, in this industry, but if you want to make it in this, you better be doing that, like finding ways to improve it beyond. Because it, it really is, what you do in the dark and when no one's looking, you know, what that's where your metal is. And I think that's important. Yeah. So it definitely comes from them.